something in my pocket. The, um, one of the, I guess, most efficient ways to understand how halakha works, how Jewish law works, is to look at the exemptions and the exceptions. Exemptions and exceptions will generally teach us how a system can be dynamic and still allow for some general principles. So Sukkot is one of the great examples of that. Basukot teshbu shivat yamim kol ha'ezrach b'Yisrael. You shall live in booths for seven days. All of Israel shall live in seven bo- in, in booths for seven days. It's actually fairly straightforward. I mean, straightforward once you figure out what the booth is. But once you make up that a booth has at least three walls that are solid and, you know, a flimsy top, then the idea is that everybody is to live in them. Almost the entire second chapter of Tractate Sukkah in the Babylonian Talmud, and the Urushalmi for that matter, is dedicated to those who are exempt from having to do precisely what the Torah says, which is live in the sukkah. And the exemptions in Mesechet Sukkah are both categorical and consequential. So a categorical exemption is that the sukkah is a mitzvata seisha hazman grama. It is a time enacted obligation. You don't do Sukkot in the spring. A particular day of the Jewish calendar enacts the obligation to dwell, to live in the sukkah. Those like children who are generally exempt from time enacted meets vote are also exempt from having to live in a sukkah. Another categorical exemption is ha'osek b'mitzvah patur min ha'mitzvah. One who is immersed in a particular obligation is exempt from having to do the other obligation. That's categorical and consequential. It's categorical that the legal category is somebody immersed in a mitzvah is exempt from another. It's consequential in that the idea behind it is likely that if I, if I have my heart and my my kavanah, my intention in one thing, I won't be able to have it in another thing as well. I'm gonna come back to that one. Another um, categorical exemption, by the way, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm about to give you all of the categorical exemptions for Tractate Sukkah, um, I think, um, is happiness and how to prioritize it. So a wedding couple, and those who are attending to them are exempt from being in the sukkah for two different reasons. The wedding couple is exempt from being in the sukkah because their primary obligation is to be happy and that has to happen in the chuppah. Now, chuppah in antiquity didn't mean, well, this is a chuppah. It didn't mean this. In the Gemara, chuppah was your first home, the place that you lived. So a couple wasn't allowed to leave, even to go to the sukkah because if they were gonna be happy, they were gonna be happy in the primary place of happiness for the first seven days of their wedding, assuming they got married like Erev Chag or something like that. The, those who are misameh chatan v'kala, or misameh chatan v'katan, or kala v'kala, those who are fulfilling the obligation of making the bride and bride happy, they are involved in that mitzvah. So their category is different from the couple. The couple's category is I need to be in my happy place, those who are making them happy are exempt from going into the sukkah because they are involved in a separate mitzvah altogether. The another categorical exemption is the mitzta'er, or the mitzta'eret. The mitzta'er is the person for whom being outside in a sukkah um, will cause them distress. It won't be comfortable. It's like an East Denise. Um, so, uh, for example, um, and this is where sort of the, if it starts to rain in your sukkah and it's not pleasant to be in there, you get to go inside. You don't have to endure the rain in the circle. The moment the rain starts coming through, the exemption kicks in. That is the category of mitzta'er. That was good. Probably the most common category is based on the midrashic understanding of the verse um, that I read to you, Basukot Teshvu. 
the, the rabbis understand that to mean ke'en taduru. You are to dwell in a sukkah in the same way that you taduru, live in your home. The idea is to take the home and move it outside. Nice vessels, nice pictures, nice linens, nice bed, or not nice, but the stuff that you have inside. Actually, it doesn't have to be nice. Um, and if you can't do that, then according to sort of the formative midrash on the verse, basukot teshvu, ke'en taduru, dwell in a sukkah like you dwell in your house. Move your house outside. Move your apartment or stuff in it outside. That is also a categorical exemption. A, a consequential exemption, or something that is purely consequential, would be like, if for whatever reason going out into my sukkah at night put my apartment in jeopardy such that somebody could break in because I wasn't there to guard it, I would have an exemption from going into the sukkah. I would not have to live in the sukkah because the consequences of being in the sukkah would lead you know, to something bad happening. And therefore, and it's not, an exemption is an exemption. Like, Patur means I don't actually have, the system itself does not require me to do it. And the rabbis often did say, look, you could be exempt and do it anyway if you want to be really pious. But with Sukkot for all of these, they weren't into that. They generally thought the extra pious on Sukkot, I'm going to struggle to get into that sukkah, goes against the very nature of Sibcha in the sukkah, of happiness in the sukkah. Now, I'll give you one, there's a good example of that. The Holcheli Dvar Mitzvah. Those who are going to do a mitzvah are in the category of involved in one mitzvah, exempt from another mitzvah. They are paturin min hasukah, the, the Gemara says. They are exempt. Then there's a story. Rav chista barava bar rav huna, ki habu aile b'shabta l'ragla l'bei resh galuta. That Rav chista and Rav huna would go to the exilarch's home to listen to Torah, to pay tribute to their teacher on the Shabbat of, or Shabbat Cholomoed, of Sukkot, Havu Ganu Arkata Desura, and they slept on the edge of the, the river Sura. Not in a sukkah. Amre Anan Shluche Mitzvah, Anan Paturim. They said, look, we're, we're, we're doing a mitzvah. We're here to learn Torah. So we're exempt from the sukkah. So we're not going to sleep in the sukkah. And it ends, the sukkah ends. It doesn't come back with, but why? Why not just do a little bit extra? Get in that sukkah. No. Extra piety, especially with ritual law, is not something that our tradition often looks favorably upon, even though it is probably one of the most misunderstood aspects of the Jewish religion today, which is to say most people assume extra piety means I'm doing what God wants for me. That may be true. I can't tell you what God wants from you. I can tell you that's not necessarily what the rabbinic tradition was asking of you, of us. Um, one more category that I want to get into, which has to do with the home, is that those who are guarding the city um, are exempt, and those who are sick are exempt. The sick are exempt because when you are sick, you can't live outside like you would live in your home. In fact, there are, the rabbis thought there were special places for people who were not feeling well that they would go to. And so to be sick and go in a sukkah would go against dwell in your sukkah. Doctors are exempt because they are in the mitzvah of helping those who are sick. That's in the Gemara also. Those who are guarding the city are exempt because... How can you possibly be walking around all of the time and trying to get into a sukkah? It's simply not possible. The piece that I found, found most interesting in the Gemara, though, the one that really caught my attention, was those who are guarding gardens and orchards. Gardens, shomrei ganot upardasim. Paturim ben bayom ben balayla. If you're guarding an orchard, or if you're guarding a garden, you are exempt from having to go in the sukkah. And for the first time in almost all of the examples of those who are exempt, the rabbis come back and ask a question. They say, Ula avde sukkah hatam velitve. Why can't you just build a sukkah in the garden? Look, you're already outside. You're in the orchard. Get the materials and build it. You can guard, and then when you're not doing your active guarding, you can get inside of your sukkah. You can do both. It's the first time they really question the exemption and think, why not go a little bit further? And then there is... 
a machloket with Abaye and Rava, two fourth century Babylonian rabbis who were often um, in disagreement with one another. Abaye said, look, somebody who's guarding an orchard can't put a sukkah in the orchard because teshvu ke'en taduru, because what you can't do is build a nice enough sukkah with nice enough materials out in the workspace of the garden or the orchard. It wouldn't be possible, it would be much too difficult, you'd have to bring in your stuff back and forth to your workplace. You can't do it. And if you can't build a nice sukkah, you have the exemption. Rava comes along and says, Pirza korale ganav. What Rava comes along and says is, no, if you put a sukkah out in the orchard, the thieves will see the way in which you're in the sukkah and not in the sukkah, and the moment you get in the sukkah, they will start stealing from the orchard. That's a, a consequential argument. If I fulfill my obligation to be in the sukkah, I will put the fruit of the orchard in jeopardy, the owner of the fruit in jeopardy. Therefore, my primary responsibility in this moment is not to the sukkah, it's to my job. It's a consequential argument for the exemption. The Nitziv, Rabbi Naftali Svi Berlin, said something fascinating about this. He said, the way to look at Abaye and Rabba is to understand that for Abaye, who said, don't build a sukkah because you won't build one nice enough, he said, a nice, a nice sukkah is a mitzvah le'ikuva, which means it is a necessary precondition for filling the obligation of Sukkot is to have a nice enough sukkah to actually live in with all of your nice stuff. And if you're not in a situation in which that can happen, you have a full exemption entirely. The perfect over the good, according to Abaye. The perfect over the good. Rava actually says something quite different. According to the Nitziv, what Rava says is it's a mitzvah ba'alma, it's situational. My situation determines whether or not I will be able to fulfill the obligation of dwelling in the sukkah. Some situations I can, some I can't. But all I need to fulfill my obligation are two walls and a third, or whatever it is, and a roof. I don't need a nice sukkah. Rava says, just get in the sukkah. If you can get in the sukkah, and there are gonna be circumstances like when you're guarding an orchard, we're not gonna actually be able to get in the sukkah. The good enough for Rava transcends the perfect. You gotta get to good enough and you'll be there. Or another way of saying it is, for a baye, each one of us as individuals conforms to the system. We have to have a perfect sukkah. And if you can't get the sukkah the tradition demands, you don't get to do Sukkot at all. For Rava, the system conforms to us, our situation, who we are. This actually is a modern legal argument as well, um, or at least the machloket, the disagreement, is part of legal philosophy today. So there's an idea um, that the rule of law can be applied generally, which is to say there is a law and you apply it equal to each and every person. It has a general application. The challenge, of course, is if the rule of law is to be applied equally to each and every person, what you end up doing is furthering inequality because not everybody's situation is precisely the same. And so um, Paul Gowder, a professor of poli sci at Iowa a few years ago, wrote an article about this in which he said, uh, formal equality of law props up substantive inequalities in a hierarchical world in which people have different capacities, endowments, and fundamental interests. One example, and then he says, and there are a couple examples he gives, but one of them is, um, for example, if the law is forbidden to recognize that there are dominant race and subordinate races and respond to those, like with affirmative action, it could reinforce the hierarchy. If you can't actually look at people's lives when applying the law, what he says is inequality gets further. He said one of the best examples of this are the post-bellum literacy tests. The post-bellum literacy tests 
were meant to be applied equally to everyone, which says every free citizen has to take the same literacy test. What, the challenge, of course, is when you apply the law equally like that, and it includes a group of people who were denied an education, then what you end up doing is furthering inequality by applying the law equally. This is challenging. That's what a baye would have us do. What a baye would say is there is a sukkah and the tradition wants it to be exactly the way the tradition wants to be it. You have to build it nice enough with all your stuff and if you can't, you have the exemption, you don't have to do Sukkot, that's it, you're out. And what Rabbah would say is actually no. Actually no. Each and every person in any moment has to look at their situation and figure out whether or not the law can, can conform on some level, even if it is not the ideal, to their particular position. Halacha Karaba. The sugya doesn't decide, but the rabbis later on decided that the halacha goes to a situational law. A law that conforms to the individual and not the other way around. That's what we learn by reading into exemptions and exceptions. We learn how to understand that our system predated the way in which modern legal theorists now are looking at how to take general law and apply it to individuals in a way that retains the system but also doesn't further promote inequality. It means treating individuals and subgroups differently sometimes according to the law based on whether or not the law will further the overall goal of an equal society. My friend um, Carla, who lives in Richmond, Virginia, uh, writes something every year on Facebook about Sukkot. She is um, living in, in, in deep poverty. She is disabled. Those two are a deadly combination for too many people. She wrote, as I've lived in an apartment with no space to build a kosher sukkah for as long as I've been Jewish, I have two sukkah traditions that take place, that take the place of building my own sukkah. She looks forward to seeing some of the pictures that appear on Facebook to try and get some of the simcha through other people's sukkot, and she shares a poem. And this is how the poem starts. My life, my sukkah. Sukkot is here once again. Candles lit, wine poured, and all the brachot said, save one, leshev basuka. There is no sukkah here in city center, nowhere for one in this subsidized high rise, nowhere for lulav, nowhere for etrog, nowhere to invite the ushpizin, the guests of our sacred historic memory, no sukkah to welcome them to. Could there be found some place fit to welcome them in the midst of poverty to a meal even as simple as the one I can afford? Sukkot, booths of wood, of cloth, of skach, deliberately fragile and impermanent to remind us of life's fragility, our need for God. My life echoes this fragility and impermanence. Poverty shatters security day by day. My life is my sukkah. Could I invite the Ushpizin into my sukkah life each night? So I, I want to say to my friend, Carla, yes, that is your sukkah. And yes, our tradition sees you, sees all of us, sees the ones of us who can't do Sukkot the way we would normally want to do Sukkot, but live according to a Rava ethic, the mitzvah ba'alma. It is situational. It is what we can do when we can do it. It is sometimes the good enough, not even the good, the good enough over the ideal or over the perfect so that we can create the sukkah we need in the moment we need it, even if it isn't the one that the Torah seems to be suggesting. That's what halakha does. That's how our system works. And frankly, if we allow it to, um, it can see us when others can't. Hug some